morning, everyone. I'm Karen Knapsky, and I'm one of the editors at Shield Glow Media. I'd like to welcome you to the Glow Forming Show on behalf of the show and Glow Forming Magazine. Uh, today we have uh, Peter, who is going to talk with you about fasteners, and he's from ST Fastening System. Thank you so very I'm much. So I'm Peter Graves. I've been an uh, engineer for about 17 years. Uh, been designing metal buildings since 89. Uh, I've seen a lot of stuff, a lot of stupid stuff, a lot of stuff that makes sense. And uh, Gary asked me to write an article about some screws and stuff, and I did that. And then he said, oh, you want to speak at this roll forming show? So here's what I am doing. Uh, wanted to kind of define the difference between a screw and a bolt. A bolt goes through a hole, it has a nut on the back where a screw kind of threads its own hole and makes a, a, makes a nut out of the substrate. And uh, different substrates have different holding powers, as everybody knows. Uh, most of screws are designed using a Industrial Fastener Institute book. Uh, they, I've got an old one there that's a second edition from 1983, and then as you can see in 2011, they've got about twice as many pages in there. So, <clears throat> and then probably in 2019 or 2021, they came out with another one, <clears throat> and uh, they define just about everything. They'll tell you what size head, what size threads, uh, give you all the options, and they kind of lay out how to design a screw. Uh, they've got everything from <clears throat> troubleshooting, uh, problems with screws, quality control, how to sort them, how to finish them, uh, zinc coating from mechanical, electroplated. It's, uh, it's kind of the bible of the screw industry. <clears throat> so the important parts of a screw is the head, the shank, which is uh, an unthreaded portion. Then you've got a threaded portion. The major diameter is the outside portion of the threads, and then it's got a point on the end. <clears throat> and they, you can make a screw just about any shape you want. Uh, you usually drive it with the head. Now there are some bolts that you can actually drive with the threaded end of the bolt. It's got a little knurl on it that you tighten it up and it will actually break off when it gets to the right torsion. But uh, <clears throat> I don't know if y'all can read that or not. There's a major diameter and then down in the root of the screw next to the shaft there's a minor diameter and depending on that distance between the two will determine if you go in or if it holds better in wood or if it holds better in steel and uh, there's also a pitch which is this distance between the crest of the thread and that pitch can vary they usually specified in threads per inch and there's a thing called a pitch diameter which is halfway between the top of the thread and the bottom of the thread from each side so <coughs> that kind of determines when they're making screws, they can kind of guess how much of a crest you got and how much of a major diameter you got and kind of size the wire that they make screws out of, depending on how deep they dig that minor thread in there. <clears throat> then there's a straight shoulder and uh, there's also an option where you can make a uh, twin lead thread where you just don't have one thread going around, you've got two threads going around simultaneously. They've also got a three thread lead and uh, as that screw's going in, it'll go in you know, twice as fast as a single lead or three times as fast as a, a single lead if you've got a three, pit or a three uh, lead screw. Then there's a head which is used to drive the screw in. That picture on the right there is a cupped head washer head type screw. <clears throat> and so that 
skirt around the head kind of holds a washer and that's what seals the screw head against the panel and then the thread they you know, clamp the panel to the substrate and there's a pilot section which needs to clear all the way through all the parts of the panel or all the substrate you're drilling through before the threads engage or your threads will engage and either rip off the thread or they'll bind that screw up in the hole and you'll break your screw off <clears throat> and then there's the flute next to the point and that flute kind of spits the shavings out that the cutting edge up near the point is uh, there's a little cutting edge right on that point and that's what spins and cuts the metal as it's going through and then <clears throat> There's electroplating that goes on it that kind of provides some lubricity or uh, it also provides corrosion resistance <clears throat> and there can be electroplating or mechanical plating or uh, they've even got <clears throat> electro deposition coatings that now are plastic or enamel or whatever <clears throat> and they help prevent corrosion as well. I uh, kind of want to describe what the call-out numbers mean when you're ordering a screw, uh, like that number A up there, the first number indicates the size of the screw and all those screws are back on that IFI, IFI book. They'll tell you what the diameter is of a number 10, number 12, number 14 screw and that's the major diameter and so they've got the ratio of where you're going to be in that range and so let's say number four is a pretty small screw and then the dash 40 that's 40 threads per inch so that screw is going to go in real slow uh, for every rotation it's only going to go in a 40th of an inch and then the last number the times 0.5 it's a half inch long so number B is a quarter inch dash 20, so that's a quarter inch diameter. It's got 20 threads per inch, and it's 5 8 inch long. And then the last description shows what kind of head they put on them. And so uh, that first is a hex washer head, square drive, drill point. <clears throat> then the second one, B, is a Phillips truss head driller. That's just a flat screw head that I've got some descriptions and images up here in a few minutes. And then that number C is the metric version of thread callouts. The uh, M is in uh, like an M3, so it would be three millimeters. And then the dash 0.5 is a half millimeter for that pitch. And then the length is by 10 millimeters. And that's a head type AB. I think I've got some images of that. Yeah, so <clears throat> there are all kinds of different heads on screws. Uh, there's so many different screws out there. This is about a hundredth of them. There are a hundred times different many screws out there that have different types of heads on them. They've got some that have tamper resistance uh, to keep the kids from pulling them off the restroom walls or whatever. Uh, most of them are Phillips head, square drive. Now they're coming out with Torx star or six lobe. And then somebody's got a spider drive, which has eight points on it. Kind of hard to find bits to drive those with, but uh, those are some of the <coughs> head sizes or styles. And then you've got different profiles of the top of the screw that uh, have different uses uh, you know a bugle head kind of sits flush uh, a phillips head screwdriver for sheet for putting sheetrock together it's kind of made to be flush with the sheetrock and then you got button heads and button flanges uh, philister heads and then most steel binding screws are hex head or uh, even wood binding screws <coughs> have a hex head with a a built-in washer on them. So there's several different kinds of heads on these things. <coughs> Wafer head is used for a clip screw like a 
standing seam roof panel. Uh, it has a real low profile. That pancake head is also, also used for standing seam roof panels. And there's a truss head that gives a real smooth profile if you're drilling over. A, it's usually for walls <coughs> because you, uh, if you put it on the roof, that internal drive is going to fill up with water and rust it out pretty quick. And uh, the modified truss head is kind of for holding lab to uh, walls so you can stucco them. <coughs> And then there's a shoulder on them. A lot of clip screws nowadays have a shoulder up there to kind of fit in the slot so the screw can, or the clip can move with the standing seam roof as you get expansion and contraction. <coughs> and there's as many thread options as you could imagine. Square threads, cellar threads, buttress threads, uh, that knuckle thread, I don't know what I've ever seen that on, but. <clears throat> There's also a British standard of screws that uh, are a little bit different than metric or uh, the United States version of screws. So they've come out with their own BA thread, which is <clears throat> British Association threads. <clears throat> and then there's the points. You can have uh, almost any kind of point you can dream up. Uh, a lot of wood screws use a type 17 and there's a lot of uh, talk what that type 17 does. I think initially it was made to, as that screw is going in, it creates a pigtail from the shaft going in the metal and it'll kind of push that metal out and it'll create a little pigtail. That type, that type 17 was made to cut that pigtail off as it goes around. It doesn't work every time. Uh, but that's where the feature is and it's hard to get them to put that exactly where it's supposed to be. And so that's some of the problems with uh, that top 17 is it doesn't really do a whole lot for drill speed, but if they do it right, it will, it will often cut that pigtail off. And then nowadays there's a drill, a self drilling point on the front of wood screws. Uh, That usually will eliminate that pigtail, but it also leaves little shavings all over your roof. So it's best to either sweep your roof or wash it down before those pigtails will rust because you'll have little rust spots all over your roof if you don't. <coughs> oh my. Uh, let's see. Okay, so the slide I put together, I put this together a couple weeks ago. This one, uh, the screw description will kind of tell what you're supposed to use that screw for. Like uh, wood screws are usually seven to 14 threads per inch. If you use a, uh, a steel screw into you know, a steel substrate, you'll want to be 14 to 24 threads per inch. The thicker the steel, you need more threads per inch. Uh, because the screws, if it gets going in too fast, it'll bind up and uh, they call it galling. It'll <clears throat> seize itself in the metal and you'll twist the screw off in torsion. And uh, <clears throat> the harder the wood, the less screw, or the more screw threads you need. But they'll also either tear up the screw or tear up the wood. Uh, and then the head prevents the metal panel from pulling over the top of the screw head in uh, uplift conditions or uh, in windstorm conditions. So that size of that head is pretty important on keeping the panel on the wall or the roof. Uh, screws are constantly under stress from expansion and contraction, you know, at night the roof panel cools off then during the day it heats up so that panel will expand and contract a little bit and the only thing holding that panel on is the screws. So as that panel's moving back and forth it'll sometimes work a screw out just because there's no, 
it's not going to work itself in, so it just kind of backs itself out after moving back and forth. Uh, and that's a, a huge problem with really inexpensive wood, OSB, thin plywood. Sometimes those screws will back out, uh, especially if they're over drilled. <coughs> Let's see. This is one of ST's more popular screws. It's for drilling into uh, <coughs> steel, They're like a metal building. It uh, goes through the steel panel into the secondary, which is typically a 16 to 12 gauge uh, per liner girt. This is in our catalog, and it kind of shows that uh, you need to drill all the way through the back side of the bottom of the substrate before those threads engage. <clears throat> Pull this right out of our catalog. This is an article that uh, my predecessor wrote and it describes drill speed and uh, how many, how fast a screw can actually drill. There's a cutting edge, like I was talking about earlier on the point, and if that cutting edge goes too fast, it'll actually burn that screw up and it'll melt that cutting edge. So then all you've got is a you know, red hot point. And uh, <clears throat> he's gone through and determined how long the thread needs to be to get through how thick a material. And he wrote this whole article. I think I've got a, another slide of it. <clears throat> so there's that cutting edge I was talking about. And if you spin that thing too fast, uh, it's not going to drill. So you really need to slow down your drill speed to get the, the most out of a screw, or you'll be burning through screws. They've got these new impact drills that uh, will spin at 4,000 RPMs. And <clears throat> the only thing you can really put in with a 4,000 RPM screw is a really small, like number 10. If you uh, try and put in a steel screw going that fast, you'll burn that tip up. You need to slow it down. You can usually tell when you got the proper speed on a screw that's going into steel because it'll keep shaving those, cutting those chips out. Once those chips get cut out, is what causes the drill point to go through. But if <clears throat> you spin it too fast, you won't see any chips coming out. So you either need to slow down or you may have already burned the screw tip off at that time. <clears throat> but this is kind of an interesting deal. He went through the math and figured out how many feet per minute that drill point can do. And then he took the diameter and backed into how many, how fast it needs to go. Uh, I think this is on our website. Y'all are interested in that. <clears throat> uh, yeah, there's the math on the, so a number 12 screw into HRB can officially drill at 90 feet per minute. Then he backed into the, how many revolutions that is. And so it was a, it's a pretty inter interesting article, depending on how hard the steel is and uh, how thick it is, will determine what speed you need to go. <clears throat> His name was Tom Halsey. He's retired now, but he's very smart guy. <clears throat> uh, Gary asked me to tell y'all what kind of screws to stock, and it kind of depends on what market you're in. Uh, you know, whole barn people don't want to stock a whole lot of steel screws, and steel binding, steel metal building people don't want to stock a bunch of wood screws. But uh, if you're going to stock screws, you should probably get several of the colors of the panel you plan on selling and uh, the different link screws. A friend of mine recommended some of this information, uh, inch and a half to two inch wood binder. Uh, then you'll need side lap screws that go on the laps where the metal panels go over each other. Uh, he said 10 boxes of each color in 18 to 20 of your more popular selling colors. So you have a quite an inventory of screws. 
Then if you've got standing seam roofs, you'll need to uh, use a standing seam roof screw. Uh, you'll need sockets, tacky tape, M-seal, or whatever you put in the side lap, or the end laps where the trim goes. That M-seal kind of prevents in infiltration of bugs and birds and whatever. And then structural jobs will need a a longer drill point to get all the way through the material and it has a finer thread so if you're going into structural screw or structural material you'll need a <clears throat> an actual structural screw and then there's closure and multi-vent and uh, like I said about a hundred or more skews get you there for starting out <clears throat> uh, why is any of this important each one of these metal panels is a exposed fastener and then I think I might have some standing seam panels in there next yeah so <clears throat> the screw is made to hold the roof on the building until you know during uh, windstorm events and so <clears throat> each one of these screws or each one of these panels will have a different screw <clears throat> spacing and as that screw spacing gets closer, obviously you get more holding resistance, but you get to a point where if you get them too close together, then you've got another problem by having too many screws in one location and it'll <clears throat> affect the wood pullouts. Uh, all this stuff is kind of relating back to when an engineer designs a building, <coughs> he'll use a building code and uh, typically everybody uses an international building code, but each one of these states has their own little building code. And so depending on <clears throat> what state you're in, they've got their own book, but they'll usually refer back to a building code called ASCE 7. They've done a whole lot of information on <clears throat> uplift and wind resistance and how to calculate <clears throat> how much pressure is on that roof in different areas. Uh, you guys have already probably seen uh, panel design resistance. So you'll have a live load, the allowable uniform load for a panel. You'll have a, a live load for when they're putting the building together and they've got all the roofers on the roof. And then obviously they get off and during a wind event, you'll have a negative wind load. So depending on what panel you use, this is a 7.2 panel, and depending how far you're spanning will give you that uplift pressure. And you have to design a panel to span that distance. So you may need to put your panels or your purlins closer together or further apart. <clears throat> and depending on what gauge you use, you'll get different resistance. Uh, and depending on how many spans it goes, like with a single span between two purlins, it has one resistance. You go with two span and has a different resistance, four span or more even has a different resistance. So you'll have to design your substrate to resist the uplift loads from the panel. And then <clears throat> you'll back into a, you'll get a Q value, which is a, the uplift velocity pressure. <clears throat> they take that number and analyze what that pressure is on the roof. So <clears throat> let's say you run through that calculation and you come up with the roof panel needs to resist 30 pounds per square foot. <clears throat> so you could go right here and uh, work a two span condition on the 30. Come on, I got my stuff over here. On the single span condition, you can span you can span about five feet. If you've got a two span condition, you can span you know six and a half feet. If you've got a three span condition, you go about six feet. Four span condition, you go out to about six and a half feet. So now you'll need screws to hold that panel down, and so. Each one of these areas of a roof have a different wind pressure on them. 
There's a zone one, a zone two, and a zone three. Zone four and a zone five are on the walls. But so <coughs> zone one will be the least amount of pressure from that velocity pressure. Whereas zone two, they'll have coefficients. So this is the gable roof. And so right there at the eave and across the ridge and on each end is a zone two. And you, I don't know if you can read it or not, but <clears throat> zone one, you hit that pressure with a coefficient of 0.9. Zone two is 1.7. So you got twice as much uplift pressure on zone two. And on zone three, you've got three times the amount of uplift pressure. So in reality, you should have three times the amount of screws. So this is a screw spacing diagram I did for a job I did for a guy. And uh, <clears throat> so I actually went through and told them where to put the screws and how wide that area was, how many screws they'll need, and uh, showed them the screw spacing. So <clears throat> that kind of helps the installer know how often and where to put screws. And this is another one I did uh, for a single slope build, and they've got a whole different set of rules for single slope and edge distances and end zones and all that stuff. So it's kind of kind of interesting when you finally get into it and figure it all out. And then <coughs> There's different transition trims and rakes and gutters and E trims and valleys and uh, special trims you can have for framed openings and stuff. And that's about all for that PowerPoint. You make any questions on that? What's the longest span of metal that you uh, recommend passing? Well, on a standing seam roof, uh, probably 40 feet, because that's the shipping length that you can get. On a screw down roof, I saw one guy recommend 12 feet, but uh, I think 20 feet's probably good before you put a lap on. <clears throat> and somehow have that lap so it has some expansion and contraction. Kind of depends, you know, if your building's 100 feet wide, you don't want to three panel links up there, so, you know, 25 feet or so, but uh, it kind of depends on the substrate, too. <clears throat> you said you can overscrew a panel, but explain that. When you're installing that screw into, uh, say, into a piece of OSB, 716th inch OSB, that's pretty thin material, and it's, it used to be pretty cheap, now it's very expensive. But, uh, <clears throat> that panel or that substrate doesn't have much resistance to torsion as you're putting that screw in. So, you know, you get that panel, you, you get that screw going in through the panel and it just needs to snug down or you're going to strip out the screw in the OSB and you won't even notice it until, you know, a couple of weeks later when the screw's kind of backed out, like I said, from expansion and contraction. That's a, that's one of the biggest problems with uh, that OSB is a lot of people over drill it. So I came out with a different screw that had a, a real wide pitch and uh, that helped prevent the torsional resist. It helps resist the torsion as somebody's trying to install it so they can really feel that, oh, okay, that screw's clamped down the panel good. You don't want to over drill that one either because you can strip out that OSB pretty good. Uh, that could happen in you know, SPF or doesn't happen in yellow pine very often because yellow pine is pretty stout. But uh, you can also do it, you can strip out in <coughs> steel. I've seen it strip out in light gauge stuff. But that's one of the main problems with over drilling, is stripping out the substrate, and then you've got a screw stuck in a stripped out hole. So those high roll screws, they work better in the OSB? I don't know what that second thread really does at an OSB. Uh, Is it all the wood expand in there? It's like a locket? Well, you're kind of pushing all that OSB wood away from you know, where the minor diameters go in. And the less you disturb that wood, 
it seems the better pullout you get. So an additional thread going in there will actually, in my opinion, it kind of deteriorates the substrate a little bit. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. the the well, those <coughs> those panel properties that I was showing you, they, I don't know if y'all ever seen a, how they test panel. They've got this huge structure that's probably 20 by 30, and they mock up a roof, and they, where they tell you to put those screws is how they determine how to get those pressures on that panel. If you've ever been down to MCI, NBCI, they've got this lab, and I walk in there and there's all these holes in the roof. And I'm thinking, what's that from? You got birds? And they go, no. When this panel explodes, it'll actually pull that clip out and shoot it up in the roof. Wow. <laughs> okay, so we watch one of the tests, and you know this panel will start to swell and blow up, and then bam, it just explodes, and crap flies everywhere. But. Uh, you need to screw it down like the manufacturer says to screw it down. And then in the corner zones and the end zones, you can add additional screws, but typically they go in the flats. That's the way that panel was made. And then <clears throat> standing seam roofs, obviously, they have the clip underneath the panel. And uh, <clears throat> that's what holds the panel to the substrate. Well, that's been about 35 minutes. I've got some other stuff if y'all like to see it. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Do you have any handout material on that? Any reference material on that? In the show? I do not. Uh, yeah, come by ST's Fastening Systems booth and give me your number and I'll put some of this stuff together. Okay. I'll even send you this PowerPoint. <clears throat> so talk about color there's as many colors out there as you can imagine uh, everybody's trying to match their screw to the panel color and the problem with that is the panel color will drift from one end of the coil to the next end of the coil it'll drift all the way across the, the coil <clears throat> and uh, we purchased a machine called a spectro photometer and it will actually yeah <clears throat> it'll actually analyze <clears throat> the color and tell you how far off it is from a standard that we've got <clears throat> Lost connectivity. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> I don't know what has happened to my PowerPoint, but here we go. So color is made up of, or you know, powder coating or paint is made up of a, a resin, and then they add fillers in there to make the color and uh, <clears throat> they're ground up pigments or uh, particles that are dispersed throughout the resin. Let's just pull up and try this again. So 
those resins kind of carry that color throughout the either the panel or the <clears throat> the powder. Okay, yeah, here we go. <clears throat> and as the ultraviolet light from sun hits these pigments, they'll start to fade and diminish the intensity of that color. Uh, so it's funny how different colors will be more UV resistant or less UV resistant. Uh, and then as that color starts to fade, obviously it, it looks a little different than what it did when you first installed it. <clears throat> but we've started putting a clear coat over our electroplating to help resist some of that uh, fading and it also resists <clears throat> corrosion. Uh, <clears throat> so as you can see, there's uh, Pantone has made a whole deck of colors and matching up colors is quite a challenge. <clears throat> uh, as I've already noticed, if everybody knows, you know, a shade off here, a shade off there can make a huge difference. And so with this spectrophotometer I was talking about earlier, <clears throat> it'll actually detect how close that is to a known standard we have in our library. Uh, usually the human eye can detect between a 0.5 and a 1.0 difference in color, uh, but this spectrophotometer will get down to the tenth of a delta E. <clears throat> this is the machine we've got, so we can pretty much cool. <clears throat> keep our colors pretty much the same as we powder coat or paint to uh, match what we've got in our database in the library. <clears throat> so it'll go through and it'll look at it. Uh, there's two or three different light sources you can use, sunlight, fluorescent light, or candle light. Since all these screws are going outside, we use uh, what's called a D65 is a sunlight at 10 degrees and uh, <clears throat> we try and hold our colors to within that 0.75 delta E which is the difference you can see. You've got to calibrate it every time. I've got a black calibrating tile, you've got a white calibrating tile and then you've got a, another calibrating tile and so it'll tell how close it was to uh, the last time you used it, you calibrate it every time, then you'll take your reading and you'll compare it to that reading that's in the library. <clears throat> and uh, it'll tell how close it was to whatever that standard was. We get most of our powder from Sherwin Williams. Here's a difference. You can see this was a Delta E of 20.32. So you, know, you got a red panel on the left and a kind of a rust colored panel on the right. Uh, so with that machine, you can kind of dial in the, the color you need or tell the manufacturer, hey, you missed this color by this much, and they can go back in and readjust, make the color the same. <clears throat> So the difference between a black and a white, I just did this for fun the other day, uh, was 49.39. So it can get down to 0, 0.0 and all the way up to 49 point, it's probably up to 50. But I uh, thought that was kind of interesting. And gray was 31 difference. <clears throat> and then that gray and white was nine difference. So matching colors is, uh, very important on 
trying to keep that straight when you're going through a, you know, into a panel, holding the panel down to the, to the roof.